Hello, my name is Monica Burrell. I'm a Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellow in Minority Health Policy. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Judith Roden. She's the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Dr. Roden has had an impressive career and a long list of honors and awards. After training as a research psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University, she spent over 20 years at Yale and served as provost of the university for two years. Dr. Roden served as the president of the University of Pennsylvania from 1994 to 2004. Under her leadership, the university underwent unprecedented growth and academic development. She is well recognized for overseeing a neighborhood revitalization program in West Philadelphia, focusing on turning outward to the community and establishing partnerships with community schools and small businesses. For this work, she has received many awards, including the prestigious Philadelphia Award and the William Penn Award. And here is where you will wish you graduated from UPenn in 2004, where she brought Bono of U2 fame <laughs> to the, to the com commencement. <coughs> Dr. Roden has authored more than 200 academic articles and written or co-written 12 books. As an international leader in academia, science, and development issues, she has been members of many leading boards and forums, including the Global Humanitarian Forum. Since 2004, she has served as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. The foundation was established in 1913 by John D. Rockefeller with the mission of promoting the well-being of humanity around the world. During her time at the foundation, Dr. Roden has focused on ensuring more people can tap into the benefits of globalization. She has been a wonderful role model for women around the world. She was the first woman to lead an Ivy League institution and was listed on the 2011 Forbes magazine, World's 100 Most Powerful Women. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodin. I will now turn the seminar over to Dean Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Judith, for uh, agreeing to be part of this series on uh, decision-making voices from the field. What we try to do here is bring outstanding leaders, because decision-making is the essence of leadership, and share uh, with our community their own insights about what it takes to make tough decisions in challenging environments. And obviously, you have had uh, a big share of those challenges, so your insight will be very welcome. Uh, and then through our webcasting facility, this goes all over the world. And I think this, I'm sure this will be a great inspiration for many people around the world. Um, our guest today is really uh, a fantastic embodiment of the whole notion of knowledge translation because she herself has been a very accomplished academician. They moved to the top leadership in some of the leading universities, Yale first as provost, then the University of Pennsylvania as president. And then, um, shaping policy around higher education. And now at the Rockefeller Foundation, her uh, initiatives have really had a fundamental uh, transformative effect all over the world. It's, it's the idea of using knowledge as one of the most powerful instruments for effecting purposeful social uh, change. Universities and foundations are multiplying organizations, organizations that take the product of the talent of people and then multiply them into actions, policies, inventions that change the life of millions and millions of people. So um, we're really delighted to have you here and thank you, thank you for, for sharing those insights. And let me just start by, by asking for you about, you know, what insights have you gained having led uh, institutions in a very different uh, character, having participated in many, many global forums. Uh, what, what are your main lessons about leading uh, uh, change in some of these organizations? Well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me. It's terrific. I've been a great admirer of the schools. Uh, many of you may know that uh, the Rockefeller Foundation f uh, funded one of the earliest, uh, maybe was the earliest funder of the uh, School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, as we began at Rockefeller to really work on uh, uh, creating and helping to institutionalize uh, public health across the world. And so it's with great pleasure that I am here 
um, in uh, in uh, so many ways where uh, we celebrate together next year a uh, hundred years of this school and of the Rockefeller Foundation and I'm a great admirer of yours Julio and so uh, all of the work that you've done in your career has been magnificent and is an inspiration to so many of us. Um, I've been privileged as you hear to lead some great uh, institutions and to really um, begin to understand what the elements of tough-minded um, but flexible leadership are all about. So generally before all of the challenges come, I think every leader needs a core set of skills. Um, perhaps five are at the top of my list. Um, I think every leader needs courage. Um, even before the tough times, leadership is an act of courage because you're out there. And so people uh, are commenting on what you do, people are watching what you say. And so it is um, in the spirit of courage that one needs to approach one's leadership. Secondly, I think strength. Um, often, even in the good times, uh, there are moments of self-doubt, let alone external doubt. I think those are appropriate. Um, and hopefully good leaders have developed coping skills around that. But I do think strength is, is really important. Third, I would say wisdom. Um, there really is uh, the kind of wise leadership, particularly um, for institutions where knowledge uh, is going to be both created and utilized. But I think more broadly, um, wisdom is a critical element. Fourth, and uh, I think essential, is passion. Um, leadership is a passionate act when done well. It really requires a sense of, of purpose and enthusiasm and, and getting up every day and saying to yourself, I am so lucky to be in this role. Um, and it, it really, if, you, if you're not, if I am not leading from um, a position of passion, uh, I don't find that I find it as satisfying as a leader um, as I might. And then fifth and absolutely critical is vision. Um, the vision to have a North Star to really determine the course that you are going to lead from and what you are leading to um, is absolutely essential. So I find those the five that are essential kind of summarized as uh, the audacity to dream, perhaps, and the tenacity to persist um, is putting those five together. And then, of course, the tough times come, <laughs> the challenges. And so if you'd like me to, I can talk about Absolutely. at least the, the two toughest challenges that, that I had at Penn and I think are the crucible on which my leadership was both uh, formed and tested. Um, the first, maybe more relevant to this audience, um, when uh, Congress passed the Balanced Budget Act in the late 1990s, one of the great challenges uh, that it created was for academic medical centers because um, a large component of the funding that came through Medicare for graduate medical education was cut out in that bill. And so academic medical centers that really had come, I think, appropriately to have that as part of their budget uh, found themselves in uh, an extraordinarily difficult situation. Penn, prior to my coming, had really committed itself to developing a completely vertically integrated healthcare system. So it bought physician practices, it bought hospitals in the region, um, we had uh, a hospital already, the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, which many of you know is the first teaching hospital in America, um, but more were required. Um, so we had 300 physician practices, we had lots of community health care centers that we owned, now five hospitals, and just before the Balanced Budget Act hit, um, the dean and CEO of the health system was about to buy an ambulance service since he really wanted a total <laughs> vertical integration. 
Um, fortunately, we didn't get to that point. Um, it isn't typical, obviously, the Harvard system is not an owned hospital system. Um, and it certainly was atypical for a university to own five hospitals, let alone 300 very large physician practices. Um, our dean and CEO was somebody who was revered um, in the um, uh, general universe of health system leaders. And um, we were characterized as in a tussle, a power tussle. Um, and I had to make some very tough decisions because it really wasn't about the Bill and Judy fighting kind of thing, which is how people wanted to characterize it. It really was about what I thought was the future of the university, which I, I, I was confident um, was going to be uh, scarred and maybe irreversibly as a result of this continuing deterioration of finances. Um, we uh, let that dean go. Um, my executive vice president and I ran the health system for several months while we tried to get the costs contained and understand what kind of leadership we wanted to recruit going forward. It was not a university, universally popular decision among our board members, many of whom were um, extraordinarily committed to um, the dean and um, what the board began to feel was that they ought to just sell the entire health system. And we began a long review of that process. As the trustees undertook it, it was a process that was completely, um, it com did completely exclude any of the faculty of the medical school and any of the faculty of any of the related health professions. And at the 11th hour, I convinced the board to pull back the process. Um, we already had two bidders on the health system and a lot of investment bankers hungry um, for the opportunity to be engaged in this. And so convincing the board that this was the right thing to do. And this is a moment, a real crucible of one's leadership because the board isn't sure the offer was very significant financially. Um, but HUP is the first teaching hospital in America. The Pennsylvania Hospital, which we owned, is the first hospital in America. And I believe in integrated education. Penn is the only Ivy that has all of its schools and centers on one campus. And we were building that kind of leverage academically in a, in a really unusual for the time interdisciplinary set of activities. And I couldn't imagine our medical education, let alone the rest of our education, not suffering from not having this distinctive opportunity. And I thought that we could turn it around. Um, it was a very, very tough decision. And um, I benefit from finally uh, being able with my senior leadership team to demonstrate to the board that we <coughs> believed we could do it. We believed we had the obligation to do it, not only the, the ideas um, to do it. We began selling the physician practices. We kept the hospitals um, in what is a really interesting and integrated uh, health system. And um, today, Penn has one of the highest margins uh, the Penn Health System of any academic medical center in the country. So um, with the benefit of hindsight, um, but it was a very, very painful period and a period in which I think all of my leadership skills were really tested. That's a fascinating uh, story and very, <laughs> very relevant to the sort of cases we try to, to, to study here at the school. Um, Judith Rodin mentioned the centennial of the Rockefeller Foundation and, and, and it is true that it is Deeply, uh, our stories are very, very much uh, intertwined. Um, our school is celebrating the centennial of its direct precursor, which was the Harvard MIT School mm -hmm. for Health Officers, founded exactly the same year. And a lot of the intellectual energy led eventually to the Rockefeller sponsored uh, Welsh Rose Report that uh, ushered a new era in public health mm -hmm. education. So in 1921, uh, actually, President Charles Eliot, who was then president of the uni university, was a 
board member at, at Rockefeller. And in 1921, Harvard University received a fabulous uh, gift of $500,000, which was yeah, enough to get you a new school of public health. And that's how <laughs> the Harvard School of Public Health became became established. Uh, that's how we purchased our first building. And, and so we, we are deeply, deeply involved. And uh, subsequently, uh, of course, the foundation has had a major influence in the way health professionals are, are, are educated. And again, uh, uh, the, the foundation now under Dr. Rodin's own personal leadership uh, was one of the sponsors of the commission that produced a report on the education of health professionals for the 21st century, which is now the inspiration for our own current reform uh, processes. And, and in, 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 in that line, let me ask you uh, something. And I, I think, as you see the composition of our audience, you will appreciate. I mean, as Monica underscored, you are a woman who has been the first to occupy a number of leadership uh, positions, the first woman to be president of an Ivy League university, the first woman president of this, you know, now almost centenary foundation, which has been so transformative. Uh, we pride ourselves that uh, about uh, two-thirds of our students are women. And um, as you reflect back in episodes like the one you, you dealt uh, with, uh, what specific advice do you provide some of the fantastic women who are going through our um, classrooms right now as we try to empower them with the tools of knowledge and skill and everything that a graduate education can provide uh, to become the next leaders in public health and in education? And what, what um, specifically <laughs> do, you, do you have about, reflections do you have about the, the specifics of this gender dimension of leadership? Um, maybe, maybe I should start with a vignette because I think it will say it all. Uh, when I was named president of Penn, uh, I was taken out to lunch by a corporate recruiter who's a friend of mine and the CEO of a very large and well-known global company that tended to recruit corporate CEOs and board members. And he said, well, you're now about to become a CEO and you're the first woman um, Ivy League president. Everybody will have their eyes on you. You have an amazing reputation. Don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at first I was sort of flattered. I focused on the amazing reputation part <laughs> and the excitement of this new role and the fact that so many eyes would be on me. And then I realized what he was saying was, be careful, be cautious. And I thought about that a lot. And of course, I was in a situation where um, I got to be tested early in a variety of ways. Um, and I realized that more than anything, as a woman leader who people were watching, being able to take risks was going to be one of the most important things that I could show. Because often it is viewed as a man's um, disposition to be more of a risk taker, to, to take those opportunities. And I really obviously wanted to take smart risks, flexible risks. And I realized that I was going to be a leader who was um, a risk taker. And uh, we took risks in the way that I just described. We took risks in trying to transform the neighborhood around us. Uh, many people told me in my first year that that is not what Penn hired me to do. Um, we spent resources, university resources, which are fungible and could have been spent on improving one of the academic departments. And so again, this view that taking a risk, doing something, standing out there, you know, I don't think you can lead from behind. And so if you've got to keep your head up and lead. And that's why the elements that I talked about earlier are so important because there are clearly moments of doubt. It's not only the external doubt, there are moments of self-doubt. And so you've got to go back to that kind of vision and North Star. I believed when we tried to transform the neighborhood around us that we needed, if we exhort our students to be socially engaged, to be responsible and 
and, and account for what's happening in the wider world? How can we as institutions not model civic engagement for our students, for our faculty? Um, but that was another tough piece of work. Um, Penn had a long history of um, incursions into the neighborhood. We were disliked um, as any sort of 40-pound gorilla or 40,000-pound gorilla um, among a, a neighborhood set of um, institutions would be. Um, and so that was another risky activity. I think in addition to risk, there's one more element related to gender. Um, I still keep a New Yorker cartoon in my office right to the left of my desk so I can remind myself of it. It's a cartoon in which they're all men sitting around the table and one woman. And obviously she's just said something. And the chairman who's at the head of the table says, that is a really interesting comment, Miss Brown. Maybe one of the men would like to make it now. <laughs> <laughs> And there really are always moments when a woman, even at the top, is made to feel invisible somehow, even today. And so you've got to kind of remember that extra element of not backing off, not accepting that um, whatever that is still in the culture that uh, often makes what a man says seem smarter or more relevant um, than what a woman says. That's a really important thing to remember. I commend that to you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the cartoon is going to be part of our popular culture very soon. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think the, uh, we've heard some very interesting insights, and I'm sure that you're training as a psychologist has given you some uh, elements for this level of <laughs> Uh, introspection that you, you articulate so beautifully. So let me uh, open up uh, for uh, comments or questions uh, from our, our audience. If anyone wants to ask a question from Dr. Roden, um, just please uh, identify yourself uh, before, before you do that. Remember, her first advice was courage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you very much for your insights. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about effective communication strategies in uh, scenarios where you may have to build bridges and make compromises. Um, I, I think it is really important, and I'll just build from the last example I gave, which was the work that we did in West Philadelphia. As I said, this was a community that had a long history and reason to dislike um, the university and how it had felt treated. And so as we undertook the work that we ultimately did, which was a multi-pronged strategy of community development, we um, bought and rehabbed housing and uh, sold it back to the community at a loss to the university so that we wouldn't gentrify the neighborhood. We built an amazing public school and then took responsibility for the other public schools um, with the school district and, and our education faculty. Um, we developed a complete economic development strategy, both uh, uh, building uh, popul and populating uh, commercial corridors and then developing a Buy West Philadelphia First strategy for all of the university purchasing. And yet none of that would have worked if we hadn't really engaged with the community. So I think I could characterize Penn's history in sort of three phases. First, it was what we would do to the community. And then it was what we would do for the community. And neither of those worked. And this was really about what we would do with the community. And it was a third and very, very different phase and a really important one. So there were lots and lots, there is no the community in West Philadelphia, and maybe that's true everywhere. And so we interacted with all of the various community groups routinely in a, in a spirit of shared partnership. And, um, and we never stopped that for all the years that we were doing the work. It was really a continuing dialogue, debate, respect, 
Um, our uh, School of Design actually developed as a result of that something that they call Pen Praxis, mm -hmm. which is community development consultation. And they have members of the community who are now experts with them in um, doing this elsewhere. I carried that lesson with me. And so, for example, the first big initiative that we had at Rockefeller um, was our intervention in New Orleans after the storm. Um, we decided, uh, we gave some immediate help in housing and the like. Uh, because we had some feet on the ground there. But we decided to watch the situation and see whether there was anything that we could uniquely do. And about six months later, it was very clear that the whole planning process had shut down. The community groups all had different views about what should get rebuilt and what shouldn't. Um, the mayor wasn't talking to the governor. Uh, city council had actually stopped meeting. And the federal government had appropriated money for the Louisiana Recovery Authority to start the rebuilding, but they wouldn't give it, or authorize, I, I never can remember which is which, but they had voted on it, but they wouldn't give it um, until a, a complete plan was presented to the federal government that included a plan for New Orleans, and the planning process had stopped. So we came in and we funded the planning process, and we said, our, our requirement for doing this, first of all, we worked with a community-based foundation, the Greater New Orleans Foundation. We built some capacity there. But we said this has got to be a really collaborative process. And so it can't just be the experts from the top down, but neither can it be just the community groups from the bottom up. And so how do we get and restart the government and the community groups and the experts all to be talking in a way that would allow a plan that was sensible, um, doable, and that would really uh, lead to, we hope, the recovery of New Orleans. We also brought um, a set of processes that engaged all of the diaspora community, because remember, a lot of the people from New Orleans, particularly those that were going to be most impacted by the plan, weren't living in New Orleans in the first few months. They were in Houston, they were in Atlanta, and really dispersed in three or four places in particular. And so we granted a public agenda to go in and really do um, large public dialogues with all of the diaspora community that influenced um, the plan. But it's all in this framework of trying to integrate that community-based deliberative process along with expert-driven processes that I really think, particularly in the 21st century, are going to be so essential. If I can just say one more thing, because I'm passionate about this now, as we think about our centennial, I think the transformation that we're seeing in the world right now is a transformation about the power of collective action after all, that's what Tahrir Square was about. That's what we fund a fantastic set of organizations linked together under the rubric of Slum Dwellers International. And if you look in these 36 countries, the really strong and, and extraordinarily impactful um, effort that slum dweller leaders are having in making governments take them and hold them um, and bring them to the table. So in Nairobi, where we work, slum dwellers were never counted in the census, and they were never put on a map. So you could look at a map of Nairobi and never see human settlements that had millions of people. Um, uh, one of, the, uh, of those human settlements, Kosovo, started to organize, as had um, the uh, Dharavi slum dwellers in Mumbai, by counting themselves, literally, by taking a census so that they could force government to make them count, by developing street addresses for themselves so that they had to make the utilities and other elements. Like the water company kept cutting off their power because they said they weren't paying their bills, but actually they didn't, never sent them bills because they didn't have street addresses. So when you think about the creativity um, of people on the ground who are coping 
with difficult circumstances, and then the power of collective action, I think this is the transformational moment in the 21st century when we're going to see more and more of that. And I've spent a lot of time working in and thinking about both how to mobilize that and how to catalyze um, it for greater impact. And one of the things that we do at Rockefeller is, is think about that a lot and fund to that issue. And that is, um, I mean, quite fascinating in the context of the 21st century because of the technologies that enable that collective action to totally. spread and, and that interestingly, I mean, in the hands of people who have been traditionally disenfranchised, become incredibly empowering because there are technologies that are in the hands of, of people that have been traditionally excluded from the more traditional technologies. We go back uh, exactly. a few centuries, uh, people who couldn't read. So uh, now, today, it's those people that, uh, that have access to, to those technologies. So it's a... Uh, you know, 90% of the world has mobile penetration. And the largest acceleration is in the developing world right. in terms of mobile phones. And uh, I think 10, or 10 years ago, everyone would have said it's going to be broadband. And as broadband goes around the world, um, it will start to make a difference. But we've seen mobile really leapfrog over broadband in many places in the developing world with extraordinary applications in health, um, in these broader kinds of empowerment things, certainly in finance and PESA in Kenya, um, was 11% of Vodafone's revenue a year ago. This is the, I mean, the mobile technology that is allowing um, financial spread uh, uh, and financial services to the poorest people in Kenya. Yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> and and then this uh, empowerment of, of for collective action. Um, I saw a couple oh, yes, of please. hands yeah. up here. So just stand up and say mm -hmm. your name, please. Hi, so my name is Jeff Yerum, and I'm getting a MPH in healthcare policy and management. And before I came here, I actually did a lot of work on healthcare IT and e-health and things along those lines. I was working for Intel Corporation, which was involved with the Bellagio <laughs> Conference. And so my question to you <coughs> on some level is perhaps twofold. One of the big problems that I see out in the e-health field right now is on some level a lack of standards. There's a lot of people out there who want to encourage innovation, so they want to let a thousand flowers bloom. But the part of the problem is all those flowers bloom and then those, those, those new um, innovations can't talk to each other. And there's no, there's no real standards around a lot of these things. And so I was wondering, what is your take sort of around perhaps becoming more prescriptive about requiring certain standards to be utilized for some of the solutions? Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> along those lines, what is your, I guess, knowledge to us about consensus building, getting people to come together and sort of agree on these are the critical things, this is what we need to focus on, and then move forward on it after they're done? Um, I hope you would see that since the Bellagio Conference, we've actually been spending a lot of time both funding and thinking about just that question. It's very tempting, and <laughs> this is really almost the opposite of my last comment, but it is so cool to be on the ground very quickly and see all of these applications, but it really is equally important to step back and say, you can't ultimately let a thousand flowers bloom, particularly in the e-health space, that you've got to have some standard setting. And so we've been advocating for and trying to get a global consensus on interoperability. Um, we all know what the problem is in the United States. Our systems, our electronic medical records and other health systems still don't speak to one another effectively. And so we've got this extraordinary opportunity of green fields in many places in the developing world where since we're starting fresh, we can learn from the mistakes of the developed world utilization of the e-health capacity and frankly not let the private sector drive it completely based on whatever their own um, proprietary technology is. So we've had great cooperation from most of the private sector actors. Um, we've been funding the Regan Streef Institute and others to really develop a global consensus on both interoperability and uh, standards for e-health. You know that we helped found and continue to fund the mHealth Alliance that is exactly uh, focused on trying to do some of these same things. So we'll keep a, a good chunk of funding in trying to assure um, that there really are global standards. That will accelerate 
Uh, we think the transformation of health systems, and we also think prevent the, the high cost that we certainly are now um, experiencing in the, in the United States and, and other places in, in the developed world to get our systems to really be able to speak to one another. Very interesting. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Please. <coughs> Hi, my name's is this it's on? My name's Matthew Bartek. I'm a MPH student, also a medical student. Um, and I came to one of these sessions in the fall with Julie Gerberding, who's the director of the CDC. And one of the things that she talked about was uh, staying on the on the exponential curve of learning and developing her leadership, her own leadership skills. I'm curious what so you, you've talked about a lot of the, a lot of the past experiences that you've had and the reflections that you've been able to draw from the, from those experiences. I'm, I'm curious also how you continue to develop these leadership skills. Well, um, after a certain point, you're developing them by being tested in the crucible of reality. You're <laughs> ma making these decisions day in and day out. I do try from time to time to read the continuing evolution of the leadership literature, but I really do find at a certain point when you are leading um, you are both learning from your own experience and you're watching other leaders whom you admire um, and learning from them uh, and also learning from those who aren't leading as effectively and, and watching that as well. Um, I also try to refresh my leadership by being involved in multiple sectors. So I'm on several corporate boards, I'm on several boards of not-for-profit entities and that's really important um, because it, it, it's a good thing as a leader to also be on a board where you're watching a leader and helping to amplify a leader's capacity to be effective because you're thinking about it in a different way than when you're thinking about it personally. You had asked for the... Hi, my name is Callie Snively, and I'm a master's student in health policy management. And I want to thank you for your insightful comments today, as well as your fabulous presentation yesterday at the Social Enterprise thank Conference. You. Um, you spoke today about the importance of vision. And given that, I'd li love to hear your personal vision for the Rockefeller Center, and specifically within the health pushing forward. Um, well, fortunately, I don't have to only talk about my personal vision for Rockefeller, because we have a wonderful team and we really are constructing this vision together. Um, as Julio said, we have a, a mandate from our founder which has given us tremendous latitude for the betterment of humankind. And uh, every so often the leadership of the Rockefeller Foundation, the board, and the leaders at that time really do ask themselves, uh, what does that mean for the period in which they find themselves? Uh, when I became president of Rockefeller, we did the same thing, and we began a, a really quite interesting and I think quite formative for our work now uh, set of analytics around what were the global trends. This was 2004, five, and, and how had the world changed as we were entering the 21st century. Um, so we did a very large scanning, brought experts in from all over the world to talk about what the global trends were of the time. And then from that, we really uh, redefined where and how we were going to approach our work. From that work, I think the simplest way of, of phrasing a very complex set of, of efforts has been we really, Rockefeller was debating when I came, is globalization good or bad? And I actually thought that we would never resolve that question. Um, what was really important was to say globalization was here to stay. How can we make sure that more people can benefit from what the positives of globalization are producing while we also work to help mitigate the risks of globalization? And um, we're very lucky. It's sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart because this was before 2008. But we saw already in 2004 and 5 the kind of fractures that could occur, 
in our global financial systems, in our global health systems. You know, we had seen SARS, and so Rockefeller had established the Mekong Basin Disease Surveillance Network as a way of kind of getting to ground zero on that. Um, we saw climate. Uh, change really producing accelerated crises and shocks around the world. Uh, so we felt that building resilience in systems, in individuals, in communities was going to be as important an element of the work as building more equitable growth, where we had always uh, really formulated a lot of our work earlier. So those are our dual pillars. Um, to assure that globalization's benefits are more widely shared and that the risks are mitigated more effectively. We work to build more equitable growth and to build resilience in individuals and, and communities and society more broadly. Um, we express those goals in issue areas and uh, we work in several issue areas that came out of our anal analysis of the global trends. Importantly, and this won't surprise you given what I said I believed at Penn, um, we often try to work at the intersection of all of these issues. So our work is very multidisciplinary, very multi-sectoral, and for that reason we deconstructed our program areas at Rockefeller because we said problems don't land on the ground conveniently in packages labeled health or agriculture or whatever. When you get on the ground, these things are deeply intertwined. And so if we really want to attack problems and we want to have impact, not just feel good, um, we've really got to redefine the way we work. So we now work with time-limited initiatives where we measure and both and, and establish the outcomes and the impact that we hope we'll have with our grantees and partners. We measure along the way because this is philanthropy, not um, so we're not running, or at least this part of philanthropy, the development part of philanthropy, isn't like running a controlled clinical trial where we don't have to crack the code till the end. Um, what we're doing is evaluating and learning and monitoring as we go so that we can change course. And that's part of the kind of flexible risk taking. We bet on brains and innovation. We're always looking for innovators and innovative new ways. Um, and as I said earlier, often we find that those innovations are coming from the beneficiaries, so-called beneficiaries, on the ground, um, where we will take innovation in that way and, and scale it. Um, as well. So it's been very exciting to really reframe how we approach our work as well as the content of what we work on with one eye always on our history um, because we have this extraordinary legacy of um, work that has been transformational. The founding and acceleration of the fields of public health and related on the Green Revolution in Asia, which saved billions of lives. Um, just over and over again, um, that kind of history sort of positions us. But So we have one eye back and one eye on the future um, all the time as we, as we try to work, and especially as we think about our centennial. But it, it has been remarkable how you were able to move from more of a sectorial set of silos into this much more integrated problem-based approach with, with those two pillars. And you know, it leads me to a, to a question. I mean, in a sense, you have the opportunity of leading civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. I, I think <coughs> universities, when they are independent from government, are a core part of civil society. And certainly foundations are a major part. Standing in the so-called third sector, mm -hmm. not, not the government, not the private for-profit commercial sector, playing that, that role, um, and, and how do you see the, the role of those kinds of organizations uh, uh, in terms of convening, of providing the kind of leadership for actually trying to get the other two sectors, which usually command much larger resources, right. both political and financial resources, to, to act in the right direction. Uh, having led you know, two of those fundamental parts of civil society, a university and one of the not only oldest, but most <coughs> uh, enlightened foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation. H how do you see that role in, in this complex 
a world with the dark and bright sides of globalization so operating simultaneously. I do think that that's a critical role and a critical space, and it will become increasingly important, not less so, because I think before the sectors operated pretty independently, so um, government did its thing, and the private sector had its own set of goals and incentive structures, and civil society saw itself as um, advocating to government or trying to hold the private sector accountable, but as um, importantly separated from. I think what we're seeing, and, and I, I find this a welcome trend, I think we will always keep our, our credibility as the kind of neutral stakeholder and convener. But increasingly, actually, I'm seeing more of a blending and a breaking down among those sectors and less of a, well, now I'm finished with my part of the problem, so I'm going to hand it off to your sector because this is your part of the problem. And a lot of effort to kind of leverage simultaneously rather than sequentially what each of the sectors is able to do best and bring that capacity to the table. And one of the things that we've tried to do, I tried to do it at Penn and we're definitely trying to do it at Rockefeller, is be that stakeholder and that convener that really gets, the, sort of greases the wheels hmm. for all of that leverage to begin to occur. So, um, as you know, we brought the, your uh, conditional cash transfer program to New York City. Um, the first time that any place in the developed world had tried um, this as a means of poverty reduction. And so this was a foundation saying to government, um, we want you to innovate, we want to be your partner, we'll fund it. Um, we need it to be measurable, and so this is a kind of government um, foundation joint effort. Um, one where all three sectors were involved, uh, again, breaking down and sort of getting leverage simultaneously. Uh, I'm just picking New York City because it's fresh on my mind. I was just writing about it. But um, New York City needed 30,000 new units of affordable housing. And they wanted both for-profit and not-for-profit developers mm -hmm. to put in the pre-construction work. and they couldn't get commercial banks to lend, and so the city couldn't yet give the offsets that ultimately would make this tax advantage for the developers to come in. So everybody was at a standstill. And when you think about the need for affordable housing all over the world, um, you can imagine that if you could create uh, a new mechanism for financing, doing the piece that every sector does best together, you could really catalyze change. So we, we um, got a group of foundations to put in the first $50 million of the greatest, the lowest tier, in other words, the riskiest capital, which we guaranteed. And behind that $50 million, the commercial banks were then willing to put in $250 million because they knew that we would absorb the first $50 million of risk. And then behind the banks, the city could put in their offsets and tax incentives and the like. So all three sectors leveraging what they did best, but no one of them could have acted alone to really produce this kind of change um, and leverage. So that's, we're looking for that all the time. And that, that's a crucial, a crucial role. Also, you have heard um, you r repeatedly talk about how in this uh, world we learn so much also from developing countries. I mean, you've made now several examples, including the one in the conditional cash mm -hmm. transfers, but also b before. And I, I think that's a very interesting way that breaks the traditional view that solutions somehow came from the north to the south. Right. Problems flowed from south to north, solutions from north to south north to south and uh, a, a much more uh, integrated view. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. So um, I, I think you had raised your hand before. So please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Shive. I'm in the MPH program in health policy and management. And I also did my undergrad at Penn from 2002 to 2006. So I'm really excited to have you here. Um, you talked about how strength and courage are important parts of leadership, and I think that alludes to the fact that taking risks and making decisions can sometimes be really scary. 
Can you tell a little bit uh, about situations where you made a decision that didn't go the way that you wanted or how you handle times where your risks didn't really pan out? Um, <laughs> I would say I have had more of those at Rockefeller than I did at Penn. Um, luckily, <laughs> Penn seemed to work all. Um, it wasn't that it wasn't risky, and, but you can see the impact maybe when you're further away. Um, we did the kind of work that I just talked about at the outset to uh, develop a new strategy for the 21st century when uh, I became president. It was a year-long and very, I thought, inclusive process. Um, and it was a great strategy. I forgot one thing, which is that culture eats strategy for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I tried to do was make the culture change to fit the new strategy in a way that didn't work so well. Those gears didn't mesh. Also, the culture of philanthropy wasn't congenial to that new strategy either. And so there was a lot of external support for the doubters inside. And I missed it. And so we had to spend a fair amount of time, not backpedaling, but healing, changing, acknowledging, slowing down in some places. and defending. Um, and I think I learned so much from that in terms of um, appreciating the power of culture. It lives in the heating system. Those people don't even have to be there anymore. But somehow it is very powerful, um, particularly in um, institutions that have had as proud a history and as strong a culture as the Rockefeller Foundation. So it was a very important lesson. Yeah, I, I, reforming uh, institutions with huge legacies, most of them positive, is, is an mm -hmm. enormous mm -hmm. challenge. And I, I think we will um, <laughs> look forward to more detailed conversations on that. <laughs> As we share our <laughs> centennial stories, I, I'd be interested to. We have one more question, and let me go to the back of the room because we've, we've been mostly focused on the first part. So why don't you have the, the last question? <clears throat> Hi, thank you very much for coming today and sharing your thoughts. Maybe drawing on, on the story that you just shared today is um, uh, just now. Um, is about the ability of academics and people um, who spend a lot of time building the specialized knowledge to serve people who don't have necessarily that knowledge. And this ability to serve depends a lot on communications. And we've seen, for example, lately in this country, the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and the disconnect between trying to do what you think is best and people not understanding necessarily that. Are there ways maybe on your experience at, in Philadelphia or other things where you found that you've learned some lessons about how to best communicate with the people you're trying to serve? Well, of course, you have a fantastic health communications program here, and we had one at Annenberg that was also um, very effective I think in, in thinking through these issues. I think there's a, a global kind of macro skill and then a micro set of skills. So on the macro level, we actually have been funding, we Rockefeller have been funding work in health diplomacy because we really think that there's a special set of skills about negotiating change in health in this particular instance, although diplomacy more broadly, as we see, is, uh, is uh, not as effective generally in, in a variety of areas, but in health in particular, where there really is the capacity to be misunderstood and misrepresented so quickly given modern technology and the like. So a lot of very interesting work on health diplomacy at the national government and global level um, requires a new way of thinking about communication. 
at the more micro level, I think that we never really appreciated we, the U.S., as the health care legislation got passed and the Obama administration specifically, um, the power at the local level for the narrative to be owned in ways that the government couldn't control. And maybe the lesson isn't so much, here, here's a president, after all, who was a master at mobilizing grassroots support, at using technology, but didn't transfer that same learned lesson to doing the same thing all over again and trying to sell a, what turned out to be controversial, um, new healthcare bill. So I think we are in a transformed world. We're in a world where communicating directly with people on the ground is going to be more and more important and knowing and accepting that you can't even then control the total narrative because it gets retweeted or the blogosphere comments back and the like. And so it's a new moment in developing a set of communication skills for important policy actions. I believe also, and Rockefeller has been doing a lot of work, we do a lot of work on innovation, particularly on innovation processes. And so we've been really interested in crowdsourcing um, as really getting the wisdom of the crowd, getting from the ground up. Um, some of you know Innocentive, which is a, 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 a for-profit company that was spun off by Eli Lilly, recognizing that perhaps the traditional R&D that large pharma was doing could never, it, it was just getting so expensive, so it could never hire enough people to always figure out what that last mile piece of the solution was. So they turned it over literally to the wisdom of the crowd and in the in a sense of developed this 400,000 person network around the world of scientists and engineers and who compete for prize money solving scientific and medical and health related problems. Um, Ashoka has a wonderful platform for crowdsourcing in what they do as collaborative competitions, a different model. Anyway, we've been funding and learning from a lot of very interesting grantees. We are starting to seed, and we gave a couple innovation grants to some departments in the U.S. government as a pilot. because So here, government is our grantee, actually, not our <laughs> partner. Um, to say maybe policy should no longer be 15 smart people sitting in a room figuring out what the best way to do something is, or even um, X number of people in Congress, I won't say whether they're smart or not, um, <laughs> who are figuring out what policy is. Maybe you ought to start thinking about crowdsourcing policy ideas and get input from the virtual crowd because we're the people. I mean, this is what it was all about initially. And so now we have a technology and methodologies where these ideas could bubble back up from the ground. And I think policy no uh, makers should take notice. We have a lot of uptake from some agencies in the federal government. And I think it's going to be a really interesting experiment. And if we could change or at least alter the way some policy is made or implemented, I think we would lick the communications problem. We'd sort of leapfrog over what the problem is because you're back to really getting um, the people uh, back into thinking about the solutions with you. Judith, I want to thank you for a fantastic uh, and very rich conversation. I mean, really thank you for the, the wisdom and the, the level of insights that you have shared with us. Uh, I'm sure everyone will take those five elements of leadership, <laughs> courage, strength, wisdom, passion, and vision. Uh, and you know, throughout your career, you have and you continue to, to lead in a way that has this fantastically enriching, multiplying effect. And I want to thank you because today for this community and for the thousands of people that are going to be watching you on the cyberspace, you have uh, also contributed to their own personal enrichment as future leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.